sind. Meet you in glory. May our raptured souls find rest beyond the river. Father, enable us to run this race successfully. May there be no casualty. Rebuke the devourer for our sake. Even as we hear from you, circumcise our ears, circumcise our hearts. May your word bear fruit in our lives. Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You may be seated. God bless you for him. Praise the Lord. Last week we started a series with a team, a friend in the wilderness, a friend indeed. Today we will be taking part two. In that series, with the topic, Kisses from Judas, like I had announced earlier. In order to flow properly with this message, it may be advisable for you to listen to part one of this message, assuming you were not here last Sunday. However, from the message of last Sunday, we saw a few things. We saw that the wilderness experience is a fact of life. We also established that it is not a matter of if, but when you will go through the wilderness experience. We also noticed that it is for all classes of people, the high and the low. King David went through it and Jesus also went through it if Jesus went through the wilderness experience then it leaves you in no doubt that it is not a matter of if but when we saw a few things from the topic of last week and we shall continue from where we stopped last week to another topic. But we also made it clear that since it is a must for everybody to go through the wilderness experience, it will be wise for you to have a sure anchor. And that anchor is Jesus Christ. If you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 7, 24 to 27, you will see the need to have this sure anchor because without it, you'll be swept away. Today, by the grace of God, as we look at the topic, Kisses from Judas, we will be looking at some principles that everyone will need to pay attention to. So today's topic is kisses from Judas. And I will take my text from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 16, 1 to 4, and 2 Samuel chapter 19, 17. I'll read both texts from the New Living Translation. First, I will take 2 Samuel 16, 1 to 4. When David had gone a little beyond the summit of the Mount of Olives, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, was waiting there for him. He had two donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 bunches of summer fruit, and a wine skin full of wine. What are these for? The king asked Ziba. Ziba replied, The donkeys are for the king's people to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat. The wine is for those who become exhausted in the wilderness. 
And where is Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson? The king asked him. He stayed in Jerusalem, Ziba replied. He said, today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather, Saul. In that case, the king told Ziba, I give you everything Mephibosheth owns. I bow before you, Ziba replied. May I always be pleasing to you, my lord, the king. Second Samuel 19, verse 17. A thousand other men from the tribe of Judah were with him, including Ziba, the chief servant of the house of Saul, and Ziba's 15 sons and 20 servants. They rushed down to the Jordan to meet the king. When you are going through your wilderness experience, you are lonely. And when you are lonely, you are vulnerable. We saw from the case study of last week that King David faced treachery from his own son Absalom. And he went through his wilderness experience. At that time, that you are lonely, you will be very suspicious that everybody is against you. We saw again here from the text we read that one man, Ziba, rushed to meet David with the provision that David needed at that time. When David saw Ziba with all those provisions, the necessities he needed in the wilderness, David was pleasantly surprised. But he made haste to ask of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the grandson of Saul. He was crippled. The nurse dropped him when she heard the news that Saul had been killed, Jonathan had been killed, the army of Israel had been routed. So in the panic, as she wanted to run away with this little boy, she dropped him accidentally, and the boy from that childhood was crippled. Over time, he grew up, relocated to Lodiba, a desolate place, that was where David called him from, reinstated him, and ensured that he ate with him every day in the palace. David called Ziba, the servant of Saul, to serve Mephibosheth and ensure that Mephibosheth's needs were met. Ziba bided his time and waited until David was in his wilderness experience. That was when he came to show support, to show love, to supply needs that David desperately needed. But Ziba had his hidden agenda. The lesson here is that when you are going through your wilderness experience, when you are lonely, when you are vulnerable, you should be careful. There are Zibas around that will want to exploit your loneliness, your vulnerability. At that time, you will be thinking that people have all deserted you. You will need to be reassured that you still have friends. So when people come showing friendship, you are likely to jump at it. 
But it is not every offer of friendship at that time that you should jump at. Particularly when you know you are vulnerable. Widows, widowers, single sisters, single brothers, those that have suffered financial loss, you are going through financial hardship. Those that are in vulnerable situations, maybe your business has collapsed or you are in debt or there is a loved one that you have been looking after, pouring your resources, your purse has been drained. At such a time, you have to be careful. We know that some sisters have suffered in the hands of many zebras of our generation. More so, when the sister is growing in age and time is not on her side, a young man will come around pretending to love you, pretending to be interested in marriage, which is the only thing in your mind at that time. And that is a very good time to take advantage of you you have to be careful we've had several stories incidents of sisters exploited and eventually left with broken hearts widows go through the same thing men will come around show some kind of affection and tend to supply the needs that otherwise the husband will have supplied. In the process, they prey on the poor widow. You have to be careful. At such a time, you must keep men at arm's distance. Or else they will take advantage of you. David was too much in a haste to receive the help of Ziba. Ziba lied to him. Ziba deceived him. And in the process, he made a hasty decision that eventually became an embarrassment and injustice to someone that he had vowed to look after. Someone he was in covenant to protect. So the implication of his hasty decision was that he broke his covenant to Jonathan. Indirectly, he broke that covenant. In his haste, he gave away everything that belonged to Mephibosheth to Ziba because he felt that he had been abandoned. That is the way you can make hasty decisions when you feel vulnerable and you think that somebody is showing you good friendship so we have to be very careful no matter who you are widowers have fallen prey to things like that people have lost their estate when false friends the zebras of this world will warm into your heart with a singular intention to exploit you. So you have to be careful that you don't fall prey to such zebras. When we saw in we saw in 2 Samuel 19 that 2 Samuel 19:17 Ziba was able to mobilize a thousand men from the tribe of Judah. And he went with his 15 sons and 20 servants to meet David when David was coming back. 
Even after the death of Absalom, David wanted to get back his throne, you know, be well established as the king and then move on. Ziba knew that David needed a show of support. He mobilized 1,000 men from the tribe of Benjamin of all tribes. The tribe of Benjamin was the tribe where Saul came from. Saul was the first king of Israel. So, all the men of Benjamin benefited from Saul. Saul was a sectional leader, a tribal leader. He was very tribalistic. So, the men of Benjamin benefited from his rulership. Now that Saul was no more and David had become the king, the tribe of Judah, I mean the tribe of Benjamin didn't like it at all. Because in their own reckoning, there was no reason why the kingship should join from Benjamin to Judah. Remember it was a monarchical system. So they all thought that when Saul will die, the son will take over just like that, but it will remain in the tribe of Benjamin and they will continue to rule forever in Israel. Suddenly, it left Benjamin and went to Judah. So David was pleasantly surprised that Ziba could come with a thousand men from Benjamin. That shows some solidarity. That further made him think that Ziba was an important person to make an ally. So, on his way back, eventually he was confronted with the truth when Mephibosheth met him. Let's read the account of David with Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 19 from verse 24. To 29. Now Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, came down from Jerusalem to meet the king. He had not cared for his feet, trimmed his beard, or washed his clothes since the day the king left Jerusalem. Why didn't you come with me, Mephibosheth? The king asked him. Mephibosheth replied, My lord the king, my servant Ziba deceived me. I told him, Saddle my donkey so I can go with the king. For as you know, I am crippled. Ziba has slandered me by saying that I refuse to come. But I know that my lord the king is like an angel of God. So do what you think is best. All my relatives and I could expect only death from you, my lord. But instead, you have honored me by allowing me to eat at your table, at your own table. What more can I ask? You have said enough, David replied. I have decided that you and Ziba will divide your land equally between you. You can see that when David was confronted with the truth, he could not face it. He had to stop Mephibosheth from further speaking. And he did a somersault and said that he has already said that Ziba and Mephibosheth should divide the land between them. But that wasn't what he said. He told Ziba clearly that everything that Mephibosheth owned now belonged to him. He gave him everything. So in order to save his face, he decided to kind of panel beat his former statement. In embarrassment, he could not face the truth. So one lesson we take away from there is never to allow the Zebas of this world, the Judases of this world, to prey on us. Because the damage they may cause could be irreversible. Even when you get to know the truth, you may not be able to reverse the damage they have caused. Mephibosheth was not able to reverse the damage Ziba caused. 
Can you imagine Ziba, the traitor that he was, now sharing the estate of Mephibosheth with him? In equal part, that's not what anybody will expect as justice. So those that can pray on you when you are vulnerable, that untrustworthy, are taking them from Satan. That is why you need to be careful. Remember, you will be in this vulnerable situation in life at one time or the other. It's not a matter of if, but when. So you need to be careful at such a time. David was a man of God. But you could see how Ziba was able to fool him. The problem for David and the problem for every one of us is that when you are in that vulnerable position, it is very easy for you to pay so much attention to your situation rather than paying attention to God. You are just mindful of those that are still supporting you, those that are not supporting you and all that. When you lose your business, when you lose your money, whatever people say concerning money or poverty, once they are talking and they mention poverty, you will be jittery. You think they are talking about you. You are very uncomfortable. At such a time, remove your mind from your problem. Put your mind on Christ. That is your anchor. David paid too much attention to his problem. And many of us are likely to do the same thing. You are trying to do everything on your own, thinking that it is through your own struggle that you will solve the problem. If they ask you, why are you wearing this dress? You say, oh, maybe this dress I'm wearing. That is why I'm not getting old. But you stop wearing such dresses. You go and start buying another type of thinking if you buy this type, you'll get the husband. Then why are you wearing this flash shoe? When others are wearing, ah, oh, no wonder. You go and all your flash shoes, you condemn them. You go and wear high heels. Then to somebody says, ah, ah, this high heel you are wearing. Ah, you are walking awkwardly. Where are you? You condemn it again. You begin to look for flash, you have already thrown away. So you see, you have been tossed here and there. But if you put your trust in God, you will not be so moved by what people say. You'll be moved by what the Holy Spirit will help you to know and do. That was where David made mistake. Assuming he went to the Lord to pray, God will have given him answers. In Bible, you look over and over when David had problems, had issues, and consulted God. God gave him answers. The scripture is replete with instances. Remember when he came back and got to Ziglag? And Ziglag had been burned down, his wives, his children, and all his men. They've lost their families. David consulted the Lord. He first and foremost, the Bible says, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Then he prayed and asked God, Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? Shall I recover all? And God assured him, to pursue. You will surely overtake and recover all. That was when he went. And he succeeded. But at this point in time in his life, he was so fixated on the treachery, on his loneliness. Though there were people around him, he still felt lonely. That's how it is. It's not just the people around you, but there are some people you want to be around you. 
You want some loved ones you can pour your hearts to. So you can be in the midst of multitude of people and still be lonely. At such a time, you must put your trust in God. Because you have a friend that is actually closer than a brother. At such times, you feel lonely. It is that friend that is closer than a brother that you should rely on. You should not necessarily be looking and magnifying your problem. And Jesus, by the grace of God, is that friend that is closer than a brother. Hallelujah. If you hold on to him, he will give you all the comfort you need. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24b. Proverbs 18, 24b. If you compare 2 Samuel 16, 3 and 4, and 2 Samuel 19, 27 and 29, you can see clearly the vulnerability of David. You can see it. So we have to be careful. Unfortunately for David, he had made his decision and it was a bad one. How do we escape this situation? How do we escape? I've told you the first thing. You have to cultivate friendship with a friend that is closer than a brother, Jesus Christ. When you make him your friend, when you desire his company more than any other thing, even when human beings desert you, you will not feel that lonely. You will get succor from him. Then you have to yield yourself as sheep to him. Sheep obeys. Sheep will not argue. Sheep will be meek. If you can be sheep to your shepherd, then be sure that he will take you to green pasture. That's where he will feed, nourish you. And that loneliness, the sting of loneliness will be neutralized. You need to be his sheep. John chapter 10, 27 to 29. John 20, uh, chapter 10, verse 27 to 29. Then thirdly, do not be in haste to take any decision when you are in a vulnerable situation. Don't be in a haste to take any decision. Whenever you are desperate, you are likely to make mistakes if you rush into anything. For example, you are looking for a house to move into. Because you are in a hurry looking for that house, if you are not careful, you may choose the wrong house. You have to be careful. You want to buy something. Don't be desperate to buy that thing. Or else, you will make a wrong buy. At every time when you seem to be vulnerable, be careful not to rush into anything. Or else you may make a mistake. And when you depend on your shepherd, he will help you to avoid such situations as much as possible. And when you get into it, he will not be your succor. And your refuge. Because you will get into it. At one point or the other. Remember Jesus got into his. 
at the point of his crucifixion. He was abandoned by all his disciples. They didn't even believe anymore that he was still the Messiah. They thought that he was the Messiah, but then from what they later on saw, how could the Son of God, how could the Messiah be stripped naked, beaten like a common criminal, crucified, and he could not save himself? In the book of Luke chapter 24, I think it's verse 23. Or is it 21? The, the same disciples confessed that they thought or they had hoped that he was the Messiah to save Israel. They hoped. In other words, their hope was dashed. So Jesus was totally abandoned. He knew what loneliness could be. So much so that even his heavenly father removed his eyes from him. Remember? That was when the thing hit home on Jesus. It was okay when men abandoned him. But the one he could not bear was when the father removed his face. Because he was carrying our sins. And the father's eyes were too holy to behold sin. So he had to remove his eyes. That was when the loneliness became total and complete. And Jesus had to cry out. Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? His heart was broken. But even at that, he remained focused. Even at that, he did not derail. Thank God for Jesus Christ. So if there is anyone that we can run to and find real safety, it is Jesus. There is nothing you are going through now that he has not gone through. He can feel your pains. Oh, what you are going through is scandalous. Jesus went through scandals. His bat was mad in scandal. Remember, the Jews didn't believe that he was the Messiah. So they were sneering at him. They saw him as a, a child born out of wedlock. They didn't believe that Mary had immaculate conception. They didn't believe that. So they were just sneering. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> the mother said uh, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit impregnated her. They will laugh. That was what he went through. He was really never accepted by his own people. So he knew and felt rejection. Are you feeling rejected? Are you feeling abandoned? Jesus went through all that. But he remained focused. He refused to be distracted. I pray that we will remain focused in him in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be here, you've been beating about the bush. You may be here. You have been backstabbed. And you are going through some ordeal. I want you to know that you cannot get help from any other source other than the real source, which is Jesus Christ. Anything else will disappoint you. It is only in Jesus that you have real hope. Don't make any mistake about that. If you fail to give him the opportunity to come and repair your life, whatever damage that the enemy has caused, 
then you will be carrying it on for as long as you live. But if you allow him to come, he will restore even what the devourer had taken away. Don't stay there and just be whining and crying and eating up yourself. Maybe people have betrayed you. Maybe you as you've suffered one thing or the other. Don't allow the devil to use that to cripple you for life. Whatever the devil gives you, will take something far better from you. Proverbs 12:10 makes that clear. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So, you'll be making a mistake to go to the devil to get solution. You would rather get more heartaches. Whatever body you are carrying, I don't know where you are in life today. I don't know the treachery you have suffered. I don't know the pain you are feeling. I don't know the loneliness you are going through. There is a friend closer than a brother. There is a friend closer than a husband. There is a friend closer than a wife. There is a friend closer than a father, closer than a mother. That is all out there opening his hands to embrace you. That friend knows your pain. It's not the type of friend you will say, you don't know what I'm going through. He knows exactly what you're going through. The devil will do everything to make you avoid him. But if you can embrace him this morning, I can assure you, the balm of Gilead will bring healing to your soul. Amen. Bitterness will not give you healing. Unforgiveness will not give you healing. Malice will not give you healing. All the people that have betrayed you, backstabbed you, lied to you, exploited you. Hating them will not bring solution to your problem. It will only add to your problem. What will give you real solution is to come to the friend that is closer than a brother. And you come to him on his own terms. You come to him on his own terms. You must forgive. If you refuse to forgive, you increase your problem. And that's exactly what your enemy wants. He wants to keep you in the position of bondage perpetually. You must let go. Yes, you are pained. You must let go. Peter denied Jesus to his face. Jesus was in the room where Peter was denying him. Jesus looked and saw Peter. Peter looked and saw Jesus. He could not bear it. Peter had to walk away to go and cry. So Jesus knows what it means to be betrayed, to be denied. Remember Judas had betrayed him. Kissed him and handed him over to those that will kill him. Now Peter, the chief apostle that he had handed over leadership of the church to, also denied him. So you will say, Judas was a thief. What of Peter? Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. But Jesus did not die with bitterness. At the point of death, he forgave everybody. He declared his forgiveness because he had even forgiven them from the beginning. The Father forgave them for they don't know what they are doing. Including those that were crucifying him. He forgave everybody. And when he resurrected, he came back specifically to restore Peter. Because Peter backslid. Peter could not forgive himself. You may be here, you have found it difficult to forgive yourself for one thing or the other you've done. 
The devil is piling guilt every day on you and you are finding it difficult to forgive yourself. Jesus is here to restore you. You don't need to carry that weight any longer. You don't need to go home back with that weight. As we pray this morning, I want you to cast all your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Let's please rise to pray. I want you to talk to him. Maybe you're here, you've not made him your Lord, you've not made him your Savior. You have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have an opportunity to do that now. He's the only one that can save you and deliver you from the bondage of sin. Maybe you're here, you're carrying the weight of unforgiveness, resentment, malice. Because of the hurt you're going through, you've been backstabbed. You've been betrayed. Maybe a brother, a sister, a trusted friend. Somebody you've done so much to help. Turn back to backstab you. You can't reconcile it. Your love was trampled upon. You were made to look like a fool. You were exploited. And bitterness crept in. Unforgiveness crept in. You'll be carrying it like a weight. This morning, Jesus is here to lift, out, lift that weight off your shoulders. All you need to do is to come to him. Your mother betrayed you, turned her back at you when you needed her most. Your father denied you, turned his back when you needed him most. You went through life struggling, suffering. And that bitterness is eating you up. Because of the treachery. Because of what you've gone through. You don't need to allow that to continue. Wherever you are, just say, Lord, take it away from me. Lift this weight. I don't want to carry it anymore. I'm tired of carrying this weight. He will lift it off you. On your own, you can't do anything about that weight. As the days go by, the weight will only increase. But the Lord will lift it away from you this morning. Ask him in humility. Don't be too proud to ask help from your Lord. As you pray that prayer, believe it in your heart. Believe that he will do for you what you have asked. By faith, receive his help. If you have prayed that prayer from your heart this morning, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are right now. But come, let us still cry to the Lord in prayer. Wherever you are, come, let us pray here together. Is the Holy Spirit that will help you. One mistake you must not make is to go back home carrying that weight. 
That's one mistake you must not make. Don't allow the devil to cheat you. Don't allow the enemy to cheat you. He will lie to you and tell you you can handle it. You cannot. You know it. You've been struggling all these years. You've not been able. Why continue to struggle? Lay everything at his feet. He will help you. Come, God will help you. Come, from wherever you are, come, come. Hmm. As you come, pray, talk to him. Talk to him. Don't think of the past. Don't remove your mind from the past. Look forward to what the Lord will do for you going forward. He will help you. He will meet you at your point of need. Mm, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, see the tears of your children. You are the one that interprets tears. You are the one that knows the composition of every tear. You are the only one that can understand The weight, the enormity, the depth of the pain that your children are going through. You know how deep the stabbing was. You know the infection it has caused. You know the festering wound that resulted from it. All that Lord will bring to you this morning. As they have come in obedience. Minister grace unto them. Minister health unto them. Amen. Minister healing unto them. Amen. Heal every wounded heart. Amen. Lift every weight. Let every weight be lifted. Amen. Let every weight be lifted. Amen. Father, I pray you will restore what the enemy had taken away. What the canker worms, the palmer worms, the caterpillars, the locusts, all that they had eaten. Father, today restore in the name of Jesus. Amen. Going forward, these ones will have better testimonies. Amen. They will look back and thank you even for the experience of the past. Amen. You will make them better persons. Amen. Give them strength. As from today, they shall not live their lives as victims. Amen. They shall live as victors. Amen. They will not wallow in self-pity anymore. They will not wallow in shame anymore. They will not wallow in denial anymore. Amen. Give them boldness. Amen. You are their father. There is nothing they've gone through that you have not gone through. Minister health unto them. Amen. Let there be perfect restoration. Amen. Those that are reconciling with you father be one with them Amen. give them the assurance of salvation Amen. may the enemy 
never have occasion to deceive them, Amen. to accuse them, Amen. and to weigh them down with guilt. Amen. Let them be free and free indeed. Amen. Let your joy flow from their hearts. Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. Glory be to your holy name. Even as every chain is broken, Amen. every weight is lifted, Amen. let these ones go and be free indeed. Amen. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we have prayed. Amen. And amen. God bless you. You can go back to your seats. Praise the Lord. We quickly take our offerings and them tithes. As usual, when the ushers will collect the offerings, if you have your tithe, then you bring it out and come out to the front. We do that quickly so that we can wrap up with this service. Choir, please. this privilege you've given unto us to bring offerings to you and for these your children that have come in obedience to return your tithes to you father bless every hand that has given bless these your children that have obeyed you rebuke the devourer for their sake expand their coast and enlighten their borders may they never lack 
May they never lack. May they never borrow. May they never beg. Lord, may everyone that has given to you today be a blessing to this generation. Amen. Thank you, Father. Because we know you will do more than we have asked for. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. If you're please coming for the first time to House of Grace, can you wave your hand wherever you are? If this is your first time of coming to House of Grace, oh, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We are glad to have you in our midst. It is our practice to welcome specially all our first timers. We have a little reception for you. We have some little gifts we will give to you as a first timer. So if you don't mind, as the choir will be singing to welcome you, if you can come out here, carry your bag, your Bible, I would like to shake your hand. You go through this door to where you will be received so that they can give you your first timer's reception. Choir, please, over to you. You are welcome here, welcome, welcome. To house of prayer, we come, we come, we come, to the house of prayer. Oh, what we fell a time, oh, 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 invite people to church let's make sure that we don't just come alone but bring others if you do that the Lord will bless you every life you bless is a blessing to you amen father we thank you for your faithfulness thank you for today Pray that as we go from your presence, we shall remain in your presence. Amen. Let this week we have entered be a week of testimonies. Amen. All those that will travel, Father, grant journey mercies. Amen. Those that have exams to write, Father, grant success. Amen. Those that have interviews to attend, Father, grant success. Amen. Those that have important decisions to make, Father, help them to decide rightly. Amen. May this week be a week of testimonies. Amen. Let it be so in the name of the Father, Amen. the name of the Son, Amen. the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.